Hi there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics, and this week I'm continuing my quest discussed in the last video to get Mini Mulcher stable and fight worthy. If you didn't see that video, definitely watch it first. I'll include a card in the top right and leave a link in the description below. I also just upgraded my equipment a bit. You hopefully noticed I'm using a proper microphone now, and I also got a GoPro Hero 8 because the Hero 6 I had been using was almost murdered by Mini Mulcher a few times already. Press F in the chat for that poor camera, though it still mostly works. Also, Thanks to all of you who have subscribed, as I've recently passed 400 subscribers with more than 95 of those in the past month. If you want more people to see these videos, make sure to like and leave a comment about what you want to see more of in the future, but I digress. Last week I mentioned a couple changes I plan to make to try and improve the bot. I'll be discussing three changes I've tried out, mainly. Using a nylock to retain the weapon shaft, some ESC tuning to limit weapon speed and acceleration, and some new wheels which I think are a bit different from anything that's been tried before. Let's start with the wheels, since I think this will be the most useful for anyone else's robot designs. Making 3D printed wheels with a custom tread is nothing new, but the tread material I'm using is, as far as I know, unique. I'm using material commonly known as surgical tubing. So why this change, and how will it help? The last version of my wheels were just a smaller version of Draconid's wheels where I used 3D printed wheel with O-rings for a tread material. I'm not the first and I won't be the last to do this. It works alright and O-rings are dirt cheap. O-rings are made of rubber, duh, specifically either nitrile or silicone rubber. The silicone variants are often a sure 50 to 60A hardness, and the nitrile versions are generally a 70A hardness. That's about the hardness of a typical car tire, but cars have a ton of weight to compress this fairly hard rubber, making a larger contact patch with the road in order to maintain traction. My 12 pound robot, however, is only 12 pounds distributed over 8 O-rings, which isn't a lot of surface area. In fact, because of the curved shape to the O-rings themselves, the contact patch is even smaller. Aurora Band is much softer, generally around 20A. The issue with those is obvious to anyone who's ever used one for a while. They get brittle and crumbly after a while, and they tend to fatigue, meaning once stretched out for a while they don't go all the way back to their original shape. Other ways to get a softer rubber tire are to cast it in soft polyurethane or silicone, but this is a very involved process, with a lot of trial and error and tons of mess. I really wanted a low-cost, low-effort material I could stretch over the tire or glue in place. This brought me to surgical tubing. Surgical tubing is a specially formulated latex rubber tube around 35 or 40 shore A hardness, much softer than O-rings, and it will basically never fatigue like a rubber band would. It never gets hard or brittle over time and always stretches back to its original size. It's also incredibly cheap, with two feet length of the size that I'm using available for a few dollars plus shipping, which is enough to make more than 20 tires. It's available with wall thicknesses from 1 32nd to 1 8th inch or more, and inner diameters up to an inch or so. My tires are 0.85 inch OD, so I got a 5 8 inch OD tube with 1 16th inch walls to stretch over them and make the final size close to that 0.85 number. These surgical tube tires are not just using a softer, grippier rubber, but they're also flat, unlike the O-rings, so there's a much bigger contact area. With the tiny mass of my one pound robot, the 60A hardness O-rings barely compress at all. So how much of a difference did this make? I took the weapon off of the bot because I was going to be testing outside my test box, and drove the chassis, which weighs 209 grams, into a scale propped up on the wall of my test box. With the O-ring tires, I got a peak of around 130 grams of pushing force. With the surgical tube tires, I got over 230 grams. Closer to 240, actually. That's an increase from 63% of the chassis' mass to 115%. Needless to say, I was impressed by this stark difference. Now, you might be wondering, why would you need pushing power for a horizontal spinner that covers every side of the bot? Well, I don't if the weapon works. What I do need, however, is traction when the bot spins up. You see, if I spin the bot too quickly, the weapon goes one way, and the whole robot's chassis wants to turn the other way at the exact same moment. The faster the spin up, the more torque the weapon motor exerts on the weapon, and the exact same torque is exerted on the chassis. All down to 5th grade science class, Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The only thing resisting the chassis spinning is the wheels on the floor. More grip means more torque can be exerted on the floor, meaning that the bot can accelerate faster and stay planted under more stress from the spin-up. So in theory, this will make a difference to how much I can push it, but I will still probably need to limit the acceleration to prevent it from flipping out. Well, after I'm done testing the self-rider, that is. Next, let's talk about the nylock retention. This is meant to prevent the weapon shaft, which is a dead shaft, from spinning under the torque of the self-writing mechanism. When I didn't have a self-writing arm on there, having it turn a bit was no big deal, because to completely unscrew itself it would need to rotate like 5 whole turns in the opposite direction of the weapon. 
The action of the bot trying to right itself and the spinning of the weapon both tend to tighten the bolt in the chassis, or now in the nut. But when the bot was tossing around, it was easy for the tip of the writing talon to get knocked into something the opposite direction and loosen it. This is again not an issue for the weapon, but if the arm isn't at the right angle position, it becomes useless as the front forks or whatever attachment I have on there will get in the way. You can see several failed writing attempts due to this in my last video. I designed a new version of the chassis which has a big hex hole in the bottom sized for the nut and it is carefully designed to leave enough material for the nut to compress against so as not to risk any hits on the top of the pole from ripping the nut through the chassis. This chassis version was reprinted in black alloy 910 which is much stiffer as well than even the white nylon I was using before and it fixes some of the issues I had with the more flexible white nylon writing pole. That one would bend under the bot too easily, sometimes failing to be tall enough to write it properly. This one will bounce right back to its proper shape. One of the other benefits to this is instead of having a variable torque from myself using my hands and going by feel tightening up the weapon shaft, I can use my electric screwdriver with a preset clutch setting to get it to the exact right tightness every time. This will reduce the variability of friction in the weapon from compressing the bearings too much, which makes a gigantic difference in how easy the weapon spins. I need to nail down an ideal distance between the shoulder bolt head and top bearing, and then I can always tighten it just enough each time so it spins freely but is fully constrained. Another change I made was to flat the shaft in a few places to give the set screw holding the talon onto the shaft something to bite into. Without this, it can easily slide around the shaft and end up in a bad orientation, but now it should be more or less stuck in one orientation after I tighten the screws. ESC tuning and throttle limits. I found out from a thread on the Combat Robotics page that I could lower the accelerations even further from 0.6% per millisecond to 0.2% per millisecond and still have full motor torque for riding the bot. This means when I punch the throttle it will spin up at the same slower rate no matter how fast I push the stick. More consistent spin up time means more consistent torque on the wheels, and like I said as long as that torque is less than what the wheels can resist, it shouldn't spin out. You can see here my tests at various percentages. I also am very aware that above a certain point the robot will go unstable, either due to vibrations getting too great for the wheels to stay in contact with the floor or the gyroscopic forces trying to bring the weapon level to the ground picking up the wheels. Even with a 40 gram plastic tri bar this happens, so I think it might be in part due to the huge air vortex that the bot creates at high speeds. The other issue I have is the faster the weapon spins, the more the robot constantly drifts to one side. I can probably do some fancy mixing to try and compensate for this by auto steering with increased throttle, but beyond a certain point I need to push the stick all the way to the right to keep the bot still and can't turn right anymore. I decided I'll limit myself to 50% throttle so I never get to that point, and this gives me a better quote unquote resolution on the throttle. Now the difference between full throttle and zero is only 50% of what it was, so every increment is a smaller change, giving me much finer control. So did all of this help? Well, partly, yes. I think that the robot is controllable now at a higher speed than it was before, but it still tends to flip itself with the throttle beyond a certain point even when the robot stands still and doesn't move at very unpredictable times. I think that when it is standing still and it flips itself, that is a case where it's purely due to the pull hold instability, because that never happens with the tri bar and it only ever happens with the steel flat bar. Um, Around 35 to 40% seems to be the point at which this might start to happen, and it'll happen more often slash sooner the higher I go from there. Um, driving around at about 30 to 35% throttle, however, it's like perfectly stable, and I think that having the better tires allows it to spin up a little bit more aggressively without it causing a bunch of problems and instantaneously flipping out. Even at a 0.3% per millisecond limit though, if I push the stick all the way up right away, it'll definitely flip itself, even if I don't let it get to full speed first, just because it's still really aggressive spin-up. 
but I think that it was able to spin up much, much, much faster while staying planted than it could with the O-ring tires. I think adding flats for the set screw on the riding arm to bite onto definitely did help, and the nylock for sure helps with making it so that I can more consistently mount the weapon, and it's also a lot easier to pull it off and take it on when I can use the screw gun to do it consistently every time. Um, however, even with the stiffer black Alloy 910 nylon chassis, I can by hand kind of push the uh, shaft side to side and see it wobble a bit that way, though front to back it's very stiff, and I'm not entirely sure if I have weight or space inside of the robot to stiffen that up. I might need to try doing something else. The other problem that I've found is that when the robot is failing to self right it's pumping current through the motor a ton that can get so hot that it actually just a little bit starts to deform the nylon. I measured with my temperature gun, and it's not getting anywhere close to the 240C melting point of the filament, or glass transition temperature I should say for the filament, um, but it definitely softens it to make it pliable at a lower temperature, less than 100C, and the motor's getting probably a little bit hotter than 80C, which is not great. Alright, so what's next? To recap, so far I have made the weapon shaft mounting more rigid side to side, made the shaft resist loosening, better vertically constraining the weapon. The nylock allows for more consistent tightening of the weapon shaft and more consistent friction. I've added as much traction as possible to prevent spin-outs at lower acceleration values, I've limited the acceleration and the maximum speed of the weapon on my transmitter, and I've tried to make self rating as reliable as possible as detailed in the last video. I have a new weapon I'm going to try out next week, which should hopefully eliminate or at least curb the pole hoed instability as a potential issue. I'm not giving up on the long thin blade I have now, but I want to reduce the number of variables affecting stability. There's five different things that could be causing a problem, it's impossible to link the issue to any one of those as the most influential factor. I need to do what I can to minimize all the other variables at play. This new weapon that I've designed has about a 3 to 1 ratio of moments of inertia about the X and the Y axes whereas the long blade I have now is about 22 times as much in X versus Y. So I'm pretty sure that it'll be much, much, much less prone to flipping the robot while it's just standing still. If you liked this video, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to comment down below and I'll get to them as soon as possible. Thanks for watching.